It's not started yet. I'm pleased to introduce Scott Brooks as our speaker today. Um, as Herb said, I've been acquainted with Scott for a long time. We had uh, offices next door to each other in building 1505 at uh, ORNR for more years than either of us cares to try to count. Uh, he, try to keep this brief. Uh, he came to ORNL in the early mid 90s um, from University of Virginia, where he had three degrees. Uh, interestingly, he started out with a degree in psychology and uh, apparently reconsidered and decided to do something simpler than people uh, for his science. So he got into the then very innovative and difficult uh, interdisciplinary field of. Uh, combining low temperature geochemistry, geology and chemistry, environmental microbiology and hydrology, um, and continues uh, working with the combination of all kinds of organisms that aren't human, as well as uh, natural systems, chemical and uh, physical. Um, he's uh, He's uh, now a distinguished R&D scientist in the Environmental Sciences Division at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, and uh, he's focused on the coupled geochemical and microbiological re reactions that govern the fate and transformation of nutrients, heavy metals such as mercury, um, and uh, radionuclides in soil, groundwater, and surface water. Uh, and he's been involved for over probably over 20 years now with the East Fork Copper Creek Mercury, which is his topic for today. Uh, so I'm pleased that he's been able to join us and uh, come up and speak. Oh. <clears throat> well, I'm just getting queued up. I just want to thank Ellen for that um, very nice introduction. Um, uh, she had asked me when um, when I first came in this morning uh, how many faces she might recognize in the building now. And unfortunately, there aren't as many faces to recognize, but it's nice to look out on the audience today and recognize a lot of old faces. I shouldn't say old faces. A lot of faces <laughs> that are familiar. <laughs> so um, today, uh, I'd like to talk to you about mercury use on the Oak Ridge Reservation, um, some stories about its environmental legacy, and some of the work we're making towards uh, finding solutions to those, those issues on the creek. Uh, while I still have your attention, I just want to acknowledge a large group of people that have been involved in this work. Um, I am going to freely use the royal we, but just understand there is a large group of people responsible for this. All the credit goes to them and all the mistakes are mine. Uh, I have been involved in a fair amount of the work that I'll talk about today, but certainly not all of it, and it would not be possible for me to be able to talk about this without all of your involvement. I also don't want to acknowledge uh, our sponsors and sustaining support, support we've had from the Department of Energy, both within the Office of, in the Office of Science, both from um, uh, Biological and Environmental Research, as well as uh, the Office of Environmental Management locally uh, for the work that we're doing. So very quickly, a, a bit of a roadmap for some of the topics we'll cover today. I'm just gonna give some general background about mercury. Uh, we, we might all be familiar with that. Uh, why we're interested in mercury at all, um, apart from uh, what we see here at Oak Ridge. Um, a little bit about the background of mercury and Y12 in, in particular. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on that because there have been a number of histories written and Carolyn, of course, has written a very nice history about uh, issues locally. Um, and then try to summarize some of our current understanding and basic research on mercury issues in general and as they apply to the Oak Ridge Reservation. And then a quick summary of some of our applied research efforts. I also want to emphasize that um, I will be skimming highlights. There's not time to go into a lot of detail on this. And just be aware that if you invited any of the other people I showed on that previous slide, they might give you a different set of highlights and a different perspective. So there's um, Mercury research is rich in its complexity and its interest. Um, I have found it so far to be equal parts fascinating and frustrating. Uh, and for us to understand mercury behavior in the environment in general and locally in Oak Ridge requires um, a multitude of disciplines, just a handful of which are shown on the figure here. Um, but it requires uh, uh, 
knowledge and expertise and investigation in things from hydrology to biochemistry, computational chemistry, and a variety of other disciplines. Uh, very quickly, just to provide some orientation, uh, you will hear me say alternately at different times, EFPC, East Fork, or the Creek. And when I say that, I'm referring to East Fork Poplar Creek that runs through the town of Oak Ridge. Um, Elemental uh, symbol for mercury is HG. We'll also talk some about methyl mercury, which is uh, a transformation product that appears in the environment. Um, I had an interesting discussion before we started today about dimethyl mercury. Uh, we're not going to say anything about dimethyl mercury today. Um, it has not been found in freshwater environments so far, uh, so it isn't really relevant to most of what we're going to talk about today. But it has its own fascinating chemistry as well. Uh, we, when we're talking about mercury or methyl mercury, there are various forms. Um, so sometimes you'll hear me talk about total mercury or total methyl mercury or filtered or dissolved uh, mercury. And I'll try to be clear about what I'm uh, describing as we get to each one of those. Uh, but just be aware that we can make direct measurements of some of these and others we infer by difference between say a total measurement and what's a filter passing measurement. And by difference, we assume that that's particle associated mercury for example. I also just want to mention this last bullet point. Um, we do make direct measurements of methyl mercury either on solids or in water, uh, but what we're measuring is the net amount of methyl mercury because not only can methyl mercury be formed in the environment, it can also be destroyed to return that methyl mercury back to the inorganic mercury form. And so while we try to be aware of those dynamics and cycling back and forth, any individual measurement we make is the net concentration at that particular time. And we'll come back to that point in a little bit. So mercury is a naturally occurring element. Um, it occurs naturally in the environment. Uh, it has a number of interesting properties, including uh, it is one of only two elements that is liquid and the only metal that's liquid at room temperature conditions, the other one being bromine, but that's not a uh, metal. Uh, dominant mineral forms are as metacinnabar, which is this black form here, and as cinnabar, which is this red uh, mercury sulfide precipitate. Um, it has, metacinnabar has been used uh, by humans for well over 9,000 years, initially because of its, its nice bright red color, and it was used in artwork like the painting of that mask. The red coloration is due to painting with uh, uh, cinnabar powder. And then later it was used, um, that is the basis for the color vermilion. It's, a, it's a finely ground cinnabar in a suspension and you can paint it on things. And if you go back into the middle ages, there are a number of different recipes for making synthetic mercury sulfide. So you could make the color vermilion in pigments. And I don't know if it's still used today, probably not. I hope not anyway. Uh, it's dominant form or a dominant way that it gets emitted um, out of these very stable mercury sulfide minerals into the atmosphere through volcanic eruptions. Because of its interesting properties, it's also found um, a lot of application in industrial uses. Um, for example, in chloralkali process, you see the chloralkali with mercury as uh, the cathode in that process. Uh, large open uh, tubs. Do I have a? Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, large open tubs of mercury is the cathode there to produce um, caustic, uh, caustic soda. Um, of course, obviously used in barometers and thermometers, fluorescent lights, batteries, and many of you may remember the pleasure of having your cuffs and scrapes treated with mercurochrome uh, when you were younger. No longer available in the United States, but you can buy it online through other countries if you really wanted to live that experience. <laughs> Uh, so because of the interest and, and the different applications of mercury, it's been heavily used over millennia now uh, by humans um, with great perturbations to the natural cycle of mercury. And this is one of my favorite ways of showing that this is a reconstruction of mercury concentrations that were in the atmosphere based on ice cores that were taken from um, a glacier in Wyoming. Uh, so you collect ice cores and this is, would be mercury that was in the air either particulate or uh, gaseous mercury that deposited on the ice and was buried in that ice record. So you can see fairly low levels of mercury uh, in the air, um, pre-industrial phase. And then you can see a number of episodic events, as I mentioned, volcanic eruptions, Tambor, Krakatoa, Mount St. Helens uh, up here, uh, that produced uh, a lot of mercury into the atmosphere, introduced mercury into the atmosphere. And then you can see a number of human-based activities like the gold rush, uh, manufacturing during World War II, and then just the general industrial revolution. 
that produced a lot of mercury and put it into the atmosphere that then deposited uh, on land surface, and in this case, on the surface of glaciers. So even though mercury has a number of beneficial properties that have found widespread use industrially, we also know that it poses a risk to human and environmental health. Uh, it has no known biological function, but inorganic mercury will bind uh, very strongly to proteins and interfere with their function. Mercury will substitute for zinc and iron as cofactors in enzymes and interfere with their function, leading to a number of health problems. Uh, there are records of mercury poisoning going back at least 5,000 years in forensic investigations of bones. Uh, most of that is likely related to the mining activities to, to mine uh, cinnabar and lead cinnabar for use. Uh, we've known that inhalation of uh, mercury zero or gaseous mercury uh, has adverse health effects. That is the root cause for Mad Hatter's disease. That we're using uh, mercury vapor in the felting process. And, uh, the hatters then, you know, uh, uh, showed a number of neurological effects. Inorganic mercury also damages the nervous system and kidneys. And what's of real concern when we're talking about mercury is its transformation into organomercurials in the environment uh, to generate methylmercury and, in some cases, dimethylmercury, primarily in marine systems. Uh, the reason we're so concerned about the methylmercury and dimethylmercury is that they are much more potent neurotoxins. Methylmercury is the root cause for minamata disease that you may have heard about. Um, and for humans, the primary exposure route is through consuming fish. Right? It's not through no other means. Because of that, mercury has become a pollutant of global, national, and local concern. The map shown here is um, a map of mercury emissions. This is from one of the um, United Nations assessments. This is from 2018. Uh, and you can see um, uh, large emission sources in the Eastern United States, parts of South America, parts of the emerging economies in Southeast Asia and China. And then there are some other more curious locations in Africa, for example, uh, that are associated with subsistence and small scale gold mining. One of the properties of mercury is that uh, gold forms an amalgam with it. Essentially, gold dissolves into mercury. So if you have a sediment that has fine flakes of gold in it, you can mix it with elemental mercury, collect that mercury, boil the mercury off, and recover the gold. Uh, but when you boil that mercury off, it's all going into the air. So that's an emissions source. Um, and so at the same time, the UN was estimating dominant sources of uh, mercury emissions. And you can see the leading cause being subsistence and small-scale mining operations. And the second leading cause is coal combustion. So these are two examples of that. And that's the reason you get large emissions in the eastern United States and some of these emerging economies that are burning a lot of coal. And then you get some of these odd places that are in um, uh, poorer economies, but you have people using gold mining as a means of, of living. Within the United States, mercury is the leading cause for fish consumption advisories. And I just show here on the left-hand side the number of lake acres that are under fish consumption advisories, excuse me, and the number of river miles that are under um, fish consumption advisories. They far outweigh the combined uh, other sources uh, of fish advisories across the United States. I think now every state in the US has a fish consumption advisory that's based on mercury levels in the fish. Uh, most of the uh, Native American territories and some of the outlying territories in the United States have fish consumption advisories based on their as well. So the reason that we're worried about mercury and methylmercury in the environment, um, I, I want to make a distinction between the terms bioaccumulation and biomagnification. In the case of bioaccumulation, we're referring to concentrations of something within an individual over the course of its life. So if you were to consume the some food source that had mercury in it, your body would accumulate that mercury. If you stopped eating that food source, your body would eventually eliminate that mercury. Um, and, and what I'm showing over here on the right-hand side is the reconstruction of a food web. <clears throat> this is data taken from the South River in Virginia that has mercury issues strongly analogous to what we see in East Fork Poplar Creek. So it's a nice example. Um, but, oh, excuse me, can you go back one slide? I'm, it's my fault. Thank you. Um, so what we're showing here is total concentration of inorganic mercury with, along the food chain. Uh, that food web is reconstructed by looking at stable isotopes of nitrogen within uh, the organisms within the food web. 
You can see in algae, the concentrations are not much different than concentrations in top predators within that system, the largemouth bass. Uh, concentrations vary by about a factor of three over the entire food web here. So inorganic mercury bioaccumulates, but it doesn't biomagnify up the food chain. And the contrast with methylmercury is that methylmercury will both bioaccumulate, but it then magnifies up the food chain as well. And so again, if you were to eat, if an individual was eating something with methylmercury, we'd accumulate it. But then if something ate you, it would accumulate your methylmercury and retain that methylmercury as well. So we see large magnification of methylmercury concentrations up the food web. The largest step being that step between water and the phytoplankton in the food web with a, with a concentration factor of about 100,000. And then each step up the food web about another factor of 10 as you go. And again, looking at data from that same study in the South River, in this case, looking at methylmercury concentrations from the algae up to largemouth bass, there's a difference in concentration of about 1,000, which is matches what we see typically in, in global analysis. Turning our attention more locally with mercury and Y12, again, I don't want to dwell on this because there are a lot of good histories that are out there. But in the 1950s and early 1960s, uh, DOE's predecessor, the Atomic Energy Commission, used about 11 million kilograms of mercury at Y12. That was the bulk of the world's mercury supply at the time. Um, and and the, you know, one thing that we that we noticed that there's about there were about 11 million kilograms in use, but one thing that sort of gets overlooked is that mercury got recycled. It was used and pumped and moved around through different buildings and processes. Uh, so even on a daily basis, they were moving millions of kilograms of mercury. That inventory continued to recycle the system. So uh, I, I, I do like to pause at this point and just note that this was the first time mercury had been used this way uh, by pumping it around and recycling it the way that it was done at Y12. Um, and I, get, I would imagine if you added it all up, they were probably moving billions of tons of mercury. Um, and, and their record keeping or their record of its handling and use was really quite extraordinarily good. Um, unfortunately, a little bit of mercury goes a long way to doing a lot of damage in the environment. They did lose about 3% of that mercury that was in inventory. Um, some of that directly discharged East Fork Poplar Creek. Um, and, and that was just uh, you know, not being aware of the environmental uh, legacy of putting mercury into the environment that way. Uh, in 1982, the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation posted East Fork Poplar Creek as being unsafe for fishing, in part because of the mercury concentration in fish and mercury concentrations in the water. But that wasn't the sole cause. There were other contaminants in the water that were coming out of Y-12 and other processes. Um, currently, mercury is the dominant cause for this for the creek to continue to be posted. There have been a number of remedial actions across Y-12 over time um, that have lowered mercury concentrations substantially. Uh, you can see here this, this old era photograph of Y-12. East Fork Poplar Creek starts within the Y-12 com compound and moves uh, in, in this direction. We'll show another map in just a second. All the buildings circled in red were major mercury use areas or some recovery facilities. And this is where the spills and leaks were taking place right along the banks of the, the headwaters of the creek. And so that was part of the reason we had issue. We had issue with mercury in the creek. Uh, a summary of those losses are shown here in the table in the lower right. And again, East Fork Poplar Creek inventory through uh, 2007 estimated losses of about 120 metric tons of mercury to the creek that contaminated the creek and sediments, bank soils, and the floodplain. So here's an <clears throat> aerial photograph of East Fork Valley. Again, as I mentioned, the creek. Uh, with its headwaters within Y-12, it flows to the northeast and then turns to the northwest as it flows to the city of Oak Ridge, and then it flows to the southwest as it meanders through East Fork uh, Valley. There's a couple of landmarks noted here just to orient you with the Horizon Center. I will make mention of some uh, data that we have from EFK 6.3 and EFK 23.4. The EFK is just a shorthand notation for East Fork Kilometer. Uh, the creek kilometers increase as you go upstream. So as those numbers get higher, we're working our way closer and closer back towards Y12 from the mouth of the creek. So the reason we're still here today is that um, even though we're lowering mercury concentrations in the water and we've made substantial improvements in water quality with respect to the mercury concentration, mercury concentrations in the fish simply aren't responding to those lowered concentrations. 
Initially, within Y12 and just upstream inside of Y12, mercury concentrations in fish declined as water quality improved, but then they flatlined. And if we look further downstream at EFK 6.3, which are these uh, filled in squares here, there was really no response. And in fact, an increase in mercury concentrations in the fish while water quality was improving. So we don't really understand what's going on there, which was the reason for a renewed interest in understanding the mechanisms of mercury movement and behavior in the environment and how it's getting into the fish. And by deepening our understanding of those processes and mechanisms, hope to find targeted solutions that will lower mercury concentrations in the fish as well. So what I'd like to try to do today for the rest of the presentation is to orient you to some of the uh, our improved understanding within the context of our current conceptual model of mercury behavior within East Fork Poplar Creek. So most of my comments now are gonna be related locally within the creek ecosystem here uh, in Oak Ridge. We use conceptual models for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons is it forces us to sit down and consolidate all the information we have and try to put it into a coherent picture uh, that will allow us to get new insights on interactions among all of these different disciplines and different data sets that I, that I alluded to earlier. Um, but it also highlights knowledge gaps in places where our understanding is incomplete or places where data are inconsistent or pointing in different directions that merit uh, additional investigation. So starting first with just looking at concentration patterns along the length of the creek as the water flows out of Y12 and along the length of the creek and then eventually uh, into Poplar Creek. So this is a summary of some data uh, over the past decade or so that we've collected that's just looking at mercury concentrations shown over here. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is dissolved mercury, so mercury that has passed through a filter. It's not particle associated. And you can see as we go from uh, the boundary of Y12 and Oak Ridge, down to a sampling point within the horizon center downstream, concentrations of dissolved mercury in the water drop precipitously over the first eight or so kilometers, and then are relatively constant from there on downstream. In contrast, dissolved methylmercury concentrations increase as we go from upstream to downstream. And so, for other contaminants and other systems, we often think, well, if you just lower the concentration, for example, of mercury in this case, we'll lower the concentration of methylmercury. But this data flies right in the face of that. We have opposing trends of concentration along the length of the creek. I've color-coded the data to, to um, indicate the different seasons of these data collections. Uh, you can see for the dissolved mercury, there's really not any kind of a strong seasonal trend. And in contrast, for the dissolved methylmercury, we see substantially higher concentrations in the spring and the summer. And that's important because it's in the spring and the summer when you know, the life in the creek is sort of waking up. You're getting uh, hatching of young fish. There are very active feeders at that point. And now you're seeing that they're actively feeding at times when methylmercury concentrations are the highest. So that may hold a key part of the methylmercury uh, story within the fish itself. Concentrations are much lower in the winter and in the autumn. The other thing that we've noticed um, when we first started doing this work was there was really no good uh, water flow data along the length of the creek. And so uh, we set up several stations along the length of the creek to measure creek flow and discharge. And we know that from near Y12 to our monitoring station downstream, flow within the creek increases. This is pretty common for most flowing rivers and creeks. Um, and it's confirmed here as well. But when we look at data like this and we compare it to the concentration data, in this case, this is now the mercury concentration I showed on the previous slide, it raises the question about whether or not this decrease in concentration is simply related to dilution. Are we simply diluting that mercury away or is it actually going someplace else in the ecosystem and we're not accounting for it? So we're trying to figure out uh, what's going on. What, how can we explain this concentration decrease? Uh, and so one way to get a handle on that is to get away, step away from concentration data and think more about mass flux. What's, how many grams of mercury are moving down the creek at each one of these points? And so that, that um, disconnects us from, from this dilution question. We can actually ask questions about how much mass is moving through the system. And we do that very simply by multiplying concentrations by the flow rate, and we can get a flux estimate, which is just expressed as a mass per time, whatever your favorite units are. So here's a summary of that data. Now this is um, uh, 
going again from upstream to downstream, when we look at total, total mercury flux at the boundary between Y12 and the city of Oak Ridge, around 1.9 grams per day of mercury, leaving Y12 going out to the creek. When we look at the mass flux at our downstream monitoring point, it's almost 10 grams per day. All right, so that decrease in mercury concentration is not a dilution effect. And in fact, what's telling us is we're picking up extra mercury along the length of the creek before we get downstream. And about 80% of that mercury is coming from legacy sources of mercury that are out in the, in the valley, either within the creek or in the floodplain that are being contributed to the creek. The other thing that I want to point out is the difference between uh, the amount of mercury that's either associated with particles or that's dissolved. So these, these river plots are showing the flux of dissolved mercury as you go down the creek and the fluxes of particulate mercury as you go down the creek. And by and large, most of this mercury is associated with suspended particles in the water column and not dissolved mercury in the creek. So this is all based on mass balance type calculations. At the same time, we were collaborating with some scientists at the University of Michigan who specialize in measuring mercury isotopes. I forgot to mention in one of those earlier slides, uh, mercury has seven stable isotopes that make it really useful for doing controlled experiments in the lab or trying to deconvolve process out of the ecosystem. And so uh, we looked at the isotopic signature of <coughs> organic mercury along the length of the creek. And those isotopic uh, signatures of mercury also suggest that we're picking up additional sources of mercury as we go downstream. So we're not making a mistake in the calculations and concentration and flow. The mercury isotope fingerprints are also saying that there's new mercury entering, entering the creek as we go downstream. The question is, where is that coming from? Um, so one of the first sources we thought about was, um, is this just bank erosion uh, and legacy sources of mercury out of the floodplain coming into the creek? It seemed like a reasonable thing to look for. And so we've done a number of uh, sort of reconnaissance sampling along the entire length of the creek, sampling bank soils along the length of the creek, and also with vertical distance along the exposed banks uh, within the creek. But one of the things that we discovered um, along in certain sections of the creek were these dark bands of material uh, that were typically buried uh, 18 to 20 inches below the surface of the, of the soil. Um, these dark bands, uh, we decided to call the historical release deposits. Uh, they are very high in mercury concentration. The soils above and below this dark band might be a few tens of milligram per kilogram mercury. And within those dark bands, we're finding concentrations in some places close to 5,000 milligram per kilogram mercury. So lots of mercury within these dark bands. And the question is, where did that come from? If we look at it under a microscope, we begin to get some idea of that. We find these fly ash spheres in there. Uh, and then we find discrete particles of mercury-rich precipitates uh, within that material. So those fly ash spheres, we think, may be related to uh, flooding events within Y12 to get high flow. Uh, of course, they were burning coal to generate steam in Y12. They were storing some of their fly ash before it was disposed of. And so we think that might be, uh, this, this, this might be related to um, material that got washed out of Y12 and then to subsequently deposited in the floodplain. Uh, this material also is, is quite similar to the material uh, that was uh, remediated. If you all remember back, um, Ellen and others have talked about this. There, in a couple of select locations, some of the uh, floodplain soils were excavated and hauled off, uh, but that was targeted. And uh, some, not, we didn't get everything out of there. And this was some of the residual, we believe, part of that. It's still buried in the bank soils. And these, these may now be... Um, likely sources of additional mercury in the creek as we go downstream. If we collect some of the bank soils and put them in solutions in the laboratory, we do see a lot of mercury that gets released and the amount that is released is proportional to the total concentration. So this sort of suggests that we could have water, either creek water that washes over that material or rainfall that percolates down through the soil and then moves laterally into the creek can be picking up mercury out of these, out of the HRD and delivering extra mercury into the creek. The other big way that we can, might get mercury into the creek out of the, uh, out of the valley in the floodplain is through uh, flooding events where you have runoff from the floodplain itself that stirs up suspended solids and some in the creek. And so we've done a, a, quite a bit of sampling during storm-driven flood events, um, trying to understand what that might tell us about sources of mercury to the creek. Uh, and so 
I show here on the right uh, a couple of pictures taken from the same location about a day apart. Um, low flow, base flow conditions. We had uh, some rain, heavy rain, and you see a big flooding event. Um, I would argue that these are two very different systems. You see water that has spilled out into the floodplain. Obviously, it's carrying a great deal of suspended solids with it, uh, just based off the, the muddy appearance that it has. And it's now uh, the, the main stem of the creek is now connected to things in the floodplain in ways that it wasn't before under these events. So one of the things that we do is um, measure concentrations that are in the water and on the solids, uh, both during base flow and during a number of flood events. And then we can plot those concentrations uh, as a function of the different uh, flow events that we have. And we get three different possibilities, right? Uh, you could see mobilization of things and concentrations might increase as the flow increases. Concentrations can decrease due to dilution as when the flow uh, increases, or concentrations may not change, and we refer to that as just chemostasis during the with high flow. Right. Um, so I'm just showing one example of one of these flood events, and in this case, in the upper left-hand panel now, uh, the the gray line there shows you the hydrograph. So we get the the flood peak comes through and then return to base flow during the recession of that uh, flood. And the red triangles, uh, inverted red triangles here show uh, magnesium concentration, which is just a, a natural part of the water. It's uh, within the minerals that underlie the, uh, the creek. And you see a nice dilution curve. It's almost a mirror image of the flood hydrograph with respect to the drop in uh, concentration and the return back to pre-flood conditions. And the lower left-hand panel is particulate mercury concentrations. And note that it Particulate mercury concentrations change from a few tens of nanograms per liter up to nearly 8,000 nanograms per liter as the flood uh, pulse passes. Very rapid drop back down to pre-flood conditions. And in the lower right, uh, what, I've died, what I've plotted here uh, is the dissolved methylmercury concentrations. And you see again a dilution of the methylmercury and a return to base flow. But in contrast to the magnesium concentrations, it takes up to 10 days for the methylmercury, dissolved methylmercury concentrations to return to pre-flood conditions. We'll come back to that in just a minute. So if we take all of these floods together and put them together and try to get a picture of what's happening within uh, the, the valley, again, now here's the magnesium concentrations over a broad range of flows, and we consistently see those magnesium concentrations dilute with increasing, uh, with increasing uh, discharge in the creek. And we interpret that to mean that the new water that's coming into the creek is lower in magnesium than the water was before. We're getting that typical dilution behavior. What we don't know is where that water is coming from. It isn't just pure rainwater. It's water that's infiltrated through the soil column and coming in uh, as well. But it, that new water is lower in magnesium than the water that's in the creek. If you look at total mercury, we see almost the opposite behavior with large increases in total mercury concentration with increases in discharge which looks like a mobilization type behavior. And we think this is indicative of suspension of creek sediment, resuspension of the creek sediment, as well as some bank erosion that's adding extra mercury into the system under the flood conditions. Dissolved, not, dissolved mercury concentrations, however, really don't change with increases in uh, discharge. And based on this data, plus a bunch of other data that I haven't had time to get into, uh, we're getting enough dissolved mercury being delivered to the creek to counteract any dilution effect. And when we look at the natural organic matter that's being washed into the creek during the storms, we believe what's happening is <clears throat> mercury being bound to dissolved organic matter. That's, it's the breakdown products of leaves and organic matter in the soils. Um, is delivering mercury into the creek and being washed in with the rainwater, which is why we see really no change in dissolved mercury concentrations as flood pulses pass. Total methyl mercury, again, doesn't change as the discharge changes. We again think this is due to resuspension of creek sediments. And the dissolved methyl mercury concentration, similar to that initial figure that I showed you, dilute away. And similar to the magnesium, this means that the new water entering the creek is low in methyl mercury. So we see an interesting contrast between the dissolved mercury and the dissolved methyl mercury concentrations. We have a lot of evidence now that would suggest that there are, there are sources outside of the creek that are delivering total mercury to the creek, but that same water traveling through the same flow path is not bringing methyl mercury into the creek. So we can begin to decide where's the methyl mercury coming from versus where's the mercury coming from. 
So I alluded to this in, that, in my previous comments now, inorganic mercury is the primary form of mercury that gets released to the environment, which raises the question about where that methyl mercury is coming from. A few rules of thumb when we're talking about methyl mercury, uh, there are not a lot of general rules, there are a lot of exceptions to these, but we know that methyl mercury is formed by some bacteria and some archaea in aquatic environments. It's typically not the form of mercury that's dissolved, that, that's being uh, released into the environment. We know that all of those methylating microorganisms are anaerobic. In other words, they live in the absence of oxygen. Methyl mercury generation is typically or very often associated with sulfate reducing conditions and conditions where methane is being produced by microorganisms. There have been some reports, a, a small number of reports that show that, that in lab cultures under iron reducing conditions, uh, you can get methyl mercury generation, but there's been no really good proof of that occurring out in the environment. So from that information, we can be, begin to constrain the, the biogeochemical conditions where we might find methylmercury being generated. And these are very low on the redox ladder. These are typically metabolisms that, that generate very little free energy for the microorganisms doing those. And it begins to help us uh, guide where we might be looking for methylmercury generation in, in a creek environment. And again, as I mentioned before um, earlier, that, that uh, what we're measuring in the environment is that net product of uh, mercury methylation, which is microbially mediated, and the methylmercury demethylation, which can occur through both biotic and abiotic mechanisms. So looking again at one of these flux uh, charts similar to what we showed for the total mercury before, we're looking at, uh, in this case now, methylmercury, very little methylmercury comes out. You remember for the mercury, the units there were grams per day, and here for the methylmercury, where we switched to milligrams per day, so much smaller flux of methylmercury coming out of uh, Y12. But by the time we get down to our downstream monitoring point, we're seeing close to 60 milligrams per day of methylmercury, leaving even three. And in contrast to the inorganic mercury, the total mercury, most of that methylmercury is dissolved, and it passes some very small molecular weight cutoff filters. So this is truly dissolved mercury. It's not just associated with particles that pass through the filter. Uh, there's a lot of data, a lot of investigations we've done to try to understand where that methyl mercury is coming from, and, and I just simply don't have the time today to get into all of the details, so I'll summarize in a few quick figures here. Uh, if we look at East Fork in terms of its methyl mercury concentration, which is this red square up here in the upper left, um, East Fork looks like a lot of watersheds that have a lot of wetlands. In fact, East Fork Public Creek has about 3% wetlands in the, in the valley. Uh, but it sustains methyl mercury concentrations similar to um, uh, other basins that have about 30% wetlands. And we know from looking at other studies from other systems, uh, wetlands can be a source, a big source of methyl mercury generation and transport into surface water bodies. But we don't see that here in East Fork. So this is, it's, East Fork is a bit of an outlier. This isn't driven just by the mercury concentrations. This is a, it's an outlier in overall. Local reference streams fall into the general pattern for the rest of the big creeks. So there's something interesting going on with these. As we showed earlier, methylmercury concentrations, dissolved methylmercury concentrations, dilute away during flood events. And if we take samples over the course of a day or two days, we find that the methyl, dissolved methylmercury concentrations are tightly correlated with the daily photocycle. So now we're getting, we're, we're trying to put all that data together and understand um, what's an explanation that would be consistent uh, uh, for all of this. Um, we know now that there are key controls on net methyl mercury concentrations that are inside the stream or on the stream bed and something that would dilute away, that would account for this anomaly, and it also would be correlated with the daily photocycle. So one of the first places we looked was within algal biofilms on the bed of the creek. These are very complex communities that include algae and bacteria and um, insect larvae and a number of other organisms that live there and have some complex uh, elemental cycles that occur within them. But they seem to fit the bill. They're inside the creek. They do respond to the daily photocycle. They photosynthesize during the day and they're not photosynthesizing at night. They're not producing any oxygen. And their activity is diminished both during and after floods, either due to scouring or burial. Right? And it takes time for them to regrow, and that might account for that long delay in methylmercury concentrations coming back up. 
And in fact, if we bring samples back into the lab and apply some stable isotope techniques, we find that those algal biofilms are a net source of methylmercury. So, you know, we took all this data and put it together and it pointed us towards looking at algal biofilms in the creek. We bring samples back in the lab. We can add inorganic uh, mercury 201 and monitor the effect, the new production of methylmercury 201 in those samples. We can also add uh, isotopically labeled methylmercury 202 and watch it disappear over time. And when we combine both of these uh, rates, we find that they are, are in fact a net source of methylmercury. So I'm gonna switch tactics here just a little bit. Um, and, and I can say some, some pretty glowing things about this because I had nothing to do with this work. This was some of my colleagues of mine. Um, when we first started doing this work uh, 12 or 15 years ago, uh, we were we we do some things about uh, where methylmercury was being generated and some of the general characteristics, but we had no idea what the genetic basis of meth mercury methylation was. And using some pretty innovative reasoning and computational chemistry and looking for specific gene targets, uh, in fact, my colleagues discovered uh, the two gene cluster that's required for mercury methylation. Uh, it's a really elegant paper. If you have the chance to read it, I, I think I would highly recommend it. Uh, searching through genetic databases, all the known mercury methylators have these two uh, gene sequences, uh, fairly highly conserved across a number of different organisms. Um, and in a real elegant kind of experiment, um, having identified potential gene targets, uh, they then took um, known mercury methylating bacteria in the lab, oops, uh, and then deleted either one or both of those genes. And if they delete those genes, those strains can no longer methylate mercury. They put the genes back into those same strains and now we recover almost full mercury methylation ability. So it was one of those classic textbook experiments. We think it's this gene, we take the gene out, we can abolish the activity, we put the gene back in and we recover full activity. So it, it, was, it's, it really was a, a tour de force. Um, and, and I have jokingly say the day the universe changed because as soon as this paper came out, it changed the way everybody's doing mercury research. Uh, and it has been really fascinating to watch this develop over the years since it was published. Um, because we were the ones to discover that, we got the jump on some of those early discoveries, which was great. Um, uh, but it did really revolutionize mercury research. And, and uh, among other things, one of the first uh, things we did was, to, was look at all of the um, published uh, gene sequences that were available in public databases to, to identify brand new um, uh, parts of the phylogenetic tree uh, that, that hosted mercury methylating organisms that we didn't know about before. And it began to help us um, search for those new organisms. Uh, some of the really important outcomes of that, I think I've lost my cursor here. Um, I, there, there were no identified uh, mercury methylators within the human gut or within fish gut. So one of the questions that, it, that had been plaguing uh, scientists for a long time was, well, well maybe you know, the mercury is just getting methylated within the fish. There's no problem with having mercury in the water. It's within the fish themselves, the fish gut, there's really not much to do about it. But we're not finding any of those methylators within fish or within the human gut. So it really does seem to be a dietary exposure and not something that's happening within the individual organism. Uh, the other thing was um, we found those mercury, methyl those mercury methyl methylation genes were ubiquitous in anoxic environments um, across the world, uh, both in the open ocean and in a variety of other aquatic environments, including, including rice paddies. We also found those genes within our samples of the algal biofilms out of the creek. Um, and then uh, just recently, uh, we have successfully isolated a novel isolate out of East Fork Poplar Creek that's shown in the orange data points and curves there. Uh, and, and that data is looking at methylmercury production over time. Uh, the Geobacter uh, species shown in the green there is a known methylator that methylates mercury quite well. Uh, but our new isolate seems to be even more efficient at methylating mercury, and that might be part of the explanation for why we see the levels of methylmercury in any sport that we do. Um, some novel uh, bugs that have not been described. I'm going to take just a moment here to uh, tip my hat to the computational chemists and computational biochemists. Um, I, I can't dwell on this because it's just not in my realm of expertise. Um, I listen in fascination when they describe their discoveries. 
Um, but they have been able to develop uh, computational models of enzyme function, for example, uh, this MERB enzyme, which is responsible for demethylating mercury within bacterial cells. And uh, there were a number of competing mechanisms that were out in the literature and through some uh, very unique computational chemistry, they were able to eliminate uh, the, the compete, many of the competing mechanisms and identify the most likely mechanism. Um, and once we had discovered the mercury methylation genes, we could begin to build computational models of those enzymes and understand how the methyl group is being added to mercury and understand why that might be happening. Uh, those are important as we think forward in terms of potential remediation, because now uh, we can begin to think about doing designer catalysts to demethylate mercury or designer inhibitors that might block the, the function of that methylation gene and stop methylmercury production, or at least lower it in that concentration. And those efforts are, are just So I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit. Um, your eyes do not deceive you. I do have pictures of Henry Ford and Nikola Tesla there. Um, this is a story that I heard a long time ago, and, and I suspect that y'all have heard this as well. Um, I heard it under a number of different contexts. The first time I heard it was with Henry Ford and Nikola Tesla, so I'm just going to stick with that. Uh, this may be a complete urban legend, but I, I find it entertaining anyway. So the story goes that uh, Tesla was visiting Henry Ford at one of his factories and they were touring about it. And as they passed a generator, Henry Ford mentioned that generator has just given us a devil of a time. We can't get it to work right. It's, it's, not, it's not doing what we need it to do, which of course did treat Tesla and he stopped and paused and walked around the generator for some time, scratching his head and sort of humming and harumphing every so often. And then he stopped and he pulled a piece of chalk out of his pocket and marked an X on the wall of the generator. And the generator started working. He said, you know, look there and you'll fix it. And so they did. They looked there and the generator started working. Ford was delighted and said, send me an invoice. Now tell me how much I owe you for it. You've saved us. So Tesla submitted an invoice for $10,000. And Ford said, I, I think I need to see an itemized invoice for that. <laughs> uh, at which point Tesla submitted the following. So he said, well, for marking the X on the wall, I'll charge you a dollar. For knowing where to put the X, I charge you $9,000. <laughs> I put that in there because we, we've got all this understanding. We're trying to remediate the creek, and we've got lots of hammers that we can swing, but we want to swing the hammer in the right place. We don't know why we're doing what we're doing. And most importantly, that we're going to do something that won't have some kind of an unintended consequence, because there are countless examples of places where we've tried to do something to improve an ecosystem state. And in, and in fact, we've done something else that we didn't anticipate. There have been trickle down effects that have had negative consequences. So again, I'm gonna use this conceptual model and just sort of step through the creek very quickly and highlight a few things that we're working on. First of all, looking at things happening within Y12 itself. Um, this is a picture of one of the pipes uh, that, that underlies uh, Y12. It's, it's taking processed water. This is hot chlorinated water that's coming, cooling water that has been discharged and then enters into the creek. Uh, what you see, this, these silvery areas are blobs of elemental mercury that are buried in the, in the pipe itself. And as that water passes over the mercury, it liberates a lot of the mercury, and that's generating a lot of the high concentrations of mercury in the headwaters of the creek. Uh, that chlorinated water interacts with the mercury beads and oxidizes it to mercury 2, which has a much higher solubility. It is not readily lost to the air and it is readily methylated in contrast to its precursor. And so all of this is, adds and contributes to the problem. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues who's now retired, Dave Watson, was looking at uh, different ways of dechlorinating that water. If you just look at chlorinated water interacting with beads of elemental mercury, we see that chlorinated water releases a lot of mercury very quickly. They are currently, Whitefield currently dechlorinates that water using sodium sulfite. And you see a slowdown um, and less mercury being produced, but, but still quite a bit of mercury being produced interacting with, with that mercury. Oh, excuse me, can you think about that? Sorry about that. Um, and then they started exploring uh, using vitamin C to dechlorinate the water. And you see that the concentration, uh, the, the rate of production of mercury in the water slows down quite a bit. And the amount of mercury that gets produced in the end is substantially lower than any of the other two scenarios. So, we can suggest uh, that there are some extra source control measures that can be uh, taken with NY12 itself. Um, one of the nice things about vitamin C is it's relatively benign to the environment. 
one of the worries about sodium sulfide is that if you overdose it and, uh, to try to dechlorinate, you can uh, get hypoxia or anoxia in the water and get fish kills, and we don't want to have that happen either. So there's a delicate balance between uh, how much sodium sulfide to add and not killing fish. Uh, so the other thing we looked at is, you know, what's the, the fate of that mercury that got dumped on or spilled on the soils uh, with NY12? This is the, the face of an excavation pit. Each of these little um, white dots in here are beads of elemental mercury that are in the soil. Uh, and if we take a closer look at it, we can see that the beads of mercury that are in the soil don't resemble these fresh silvery mercury beads, but they've got sort of this hazy coating on them. They've been weathered to something different. And if we look at them under an SEM, uh, we find that in fact, they are coated with mercury oxide that has a very different geochemical behavior than elemental mercury does, similar to what we showed in the previous graph. Uh, if we just look at the amount of mercury that gets released from these weathered beads of mercury, concentrations are significantly higher than for fresh mercury. And we've been able to reproduce this uh, morphology and, and this phenomenon by reacting free phase of fresh mercury with different minerals that are present in the soil. So we have an idea of where this is coming. Again, this is just a cautionary tale. Um, we frequently receive um, feelers and information handouts from companies that are developing remediation technologies that can be applied to soils. And almost all of the data is generated using these fresh shiny beads of mercury, and we have no idea if they're going to be affected for something like this. Um, so as we mentioned, the bank erosion and leaching through bank soils can be a source of mercury to the water, so we're exploring ways of mitigating uh, those effects. Our prior sampling has shown that water moving through the soil can deliver both mercury and some methyl mercury to the creek and that bank erosion can deliver high concentrations of particle associated mercury to the creek. So some of the things we're looking into are ways to stabilize the banks and ways to remove mercury and methyl mercury from the water, both in the creek itself and from the water that's passing through the creek bank. And again, with an eye on minimizing ecological disruption because we can take big actions, but we might also have big negative consequences. And I show here um, one, one way of doing that. This is taken from South River. Uh, as I mentioned before, they've got a mercury problem strongly analogous to East Fork Poplar Creek. Uh, this is work that was, um, was being done, uh, funded by DuPont because they own the problem in the South River. Uh, but their approach has been to um, uh, apply some grading to the creek banks uh, so they have a, a less steep slope. And then they apply this GSL textile over the top. And within each of these openings in there, they're adding sorbents uh, so that any water that happens to pass through that's carrying mercury, hopefully will remove all that mercury before it actually gets into the creek. Um, we've been interacting with the group at South River and DuPont for uh, well over a decade now, and we've been exchanging information and lessons learned. And so we're exploring some similar options that might be available to use and explore. Uh, as we get to um, uh, thinking about those options, we, we know that we don't want to, and we don't necessarily need to uh, deploy remedial uh, actions across the entire 26 kilometers of the creek. And so we want to try to identify which are the, the most effective places to do those kind of things. And if we think about bank erosion, uh, we'd like to be able to get some kind of a quantitative estimate of where the, where the soils are being are coming off of the creek bank and adding that mercury to the creek itself. And so we've turned to using some terrestrial laser scanning. The idea being that you put up essentially a sort of a LIDAR instrument on a tripod at a fixed location and it collects uh, this cloud of millions of points. Uh, here's an example of, of what that reconstruction looks like. This was a cinder block wall we were using just trying to calibrate the instrument and the technology uh, and the data processing as well, because that's, that's uh, quite tricky also. Uh, so you can see, you know, we, this looks just like a block of cinder block or a wall of cinder blocks. And then we apply that to sections of the creek bank, and we can now begin to get estimates. I think the time lapse from start to finish on this was a few months, where we got about nine cubic feet of bank erosion over, uh, I think this was uh, about three meters in, in length and about a meter high. Uh, so we're, we're beginning to get an idea of, of where we're getting a lot of that bank soil contributed into the creek. And then the idea would be to couple maps of the bank erosion hazard with our mapping of bank soil concentrations of mercury and then identify high priority sites 
where we could go in and do bank stabilization, bank remediation, similar to that photograph I showed from uh, East uh, from South River. Um, so what, what would you actually add into those geotextile membranes that would remove the mercury from the water? Uh, we've been investigating a number of different sorbents, uh, and the way we do that is pretty straightforward. Uh, we get a solution that has either mercury or nothing mercury in it, and we mix in one of these solid phases, and then we separate the solid from the liquid, and you measure the remaining mercury that's in solution to see how effective that solid is in removing the mercury or methyl mercury from the water. Uh, so these are some of the things that we've looked at, uh, all the way from biochar to brass mesh, uh, to some uh, self-assembled monolayers that style SAMs, and then a number of others that are shown here in between. And here's an example of what some data like that looks like. In this case, looking at uh, biochar, so the biochar that came from Colorado pine. Uh, so biochar, for those who are not familiar, uh, you can get an agricultural waste or a woody debris, and uh, you cook it in a kiln in the absence of oxygen at high temperature. And you end up with something that's similar to an activated carbon product. Um, but here in this case, you can use an agricultural waste or a waste material and end up with the beneficial product. Um, so here's some data shown now where we're looking at the amount of mercury that got absorbed onto biochar as a function of the starting part or the equilibrium amount of mercury that's in solution. So you can see we get quite a bit of mercury onto the biochar, quite a bit of methyl mercury onto the biochar. And again, a cautionary tale, we know that in the water there's a lot of dissolved organic matter. Uh, and if we add organic matter, natural organic matter into these solutions, we find that there's quite a depression in the amount of mercury or methyl mercury that they can absorb. It doesn't mean that we can't use sorbents, it just means that we want to use representative water chemistry so that when we try to understand what we can deploy in the creek, we actually have representative water chemistries and we can get some idea about how those sorbents might behave once they are deployed uh, in, the, in the ecosystem. So we continue to work on this technology. Uh, these, these white coupons that you see on the bed of the creek, uh, this is a picture from East Fork, are some of these sorbents so we can measure or get an idea of how they perform under real world conditions with real water chemistries. Uh, so another question we've been asking you know, again with this idea of, of lowering or having no unintended, unintended consequences is to look at the broader implications of adding sorbents to the creek ecosystem. And so one way that we've looked at that is to do what we are just calling bucket tests because we're doing them in buckets in the lab, but we're using sediments that we've collected from the creek, water from the creek, and then we use a number of different treatments where we're looking at different sorbents that are blended in or mixed in uh, with the um, uh, with the sediments, we add creek water to that, we let those equilibrate, and then we add California black worms, they are very small worms, and I can't apologize enough to my postdoc because she has counted close to millions of worms one by one and moves these one by one, so we count how many worms go into the bucket, and we count how many worms come out of the bucket, make sure we're not killing worms, the health of the worms are, um, but she's been uh, amazing at that. Um, so anyway, we put the worms in and then we measure mercury and methyl mercury concentrations in the worms at the end of the experiment to see if adding sorbents in here can break that chain of bioaccumulation. If we can prevent the methyl mercury from getting into the worms at the base of the food chain, perhaps we can be effective in lowering mercury concentrations in the fish at the top of the food chain. So very quickly, if we take a look at just a, some of the results we've gotten from that, um, this is total methyl mercury in the buckets at the end of one of the experiments. We've got a, a negative control where we didn't add anything, a positive control that just has clean quartz sand added to it, and then three of the sorbents. And unfortunately, what we find is that the you know, total amount of methyl mercury in the system is substantially higher when we add sorbents into these buckets. The good news is that most of that methyl mercury is on the sorbents or on the solid phase and not in the dissolved phase. And we think that's a good thing. And we back that up by looking at the amount of methyl mercury in the worms themselves. And in fact, in those treatments where we've got sorbents blended into the sediments, the total methyl mercury in the worms was substantially lower than it was in either of the control treatments. So we do lower methyl mercury concentrations in the worms. We may be breaking that chain of bioaccumulation and biomagnification within the food web. We have to keep our eye on, on this troubling data over here, where we're actually increasing the total amount of methyl mercury in the system. 
Uh, worms are not the only part of the food chain. They're not the only thing living out there. And there are other filter feeders uh, that, that ingest a lot of sediment. So we, we, we need to continue on this work and make sure what the total implications are. We've also been exploring uh, ways of eco manipulation as a novel way to decrease methyl mercury concentrations in the creek. So I, I showed in that mercury flux diagram um, a number of slides ago that the amount of particulate mercury in the creek is quite high and it increases as we go downstream. And I just emphasize that again here. We look at the percent of particulate mercury as we go from upstream to downstream. Particulate mercury increases as a percentage of the total mercury very fast. And then it's fairly steady downstream at about 80% of the mercury is associated with particles. And so some of my colleagues <clears throat> have been looking at um, uh, repopulating the creek with uh, Asian clams or rainbow mussels or some others. This is a time lapse photograph. All of these three aquaria began looking like this on the far left. Uh, they had a lot of algae suspended in there. And then this aquarium has Asian clams in it. This has rainbow mussels. Two hours later, the clams and mussels have cleaned all of the suspended particles out of the water. Uh, so the idea would be that uh, we could um, repopulate the, the creek uh, or enhance the population of clams and mussels. Um, we're not removing mercury from the creek itself, but we're removing that particulate mercury from the water column and it's, it um, can't enter into the methylation chain. So at least we're temporarily delaying it from getting methylated, hopefully <laughs> slowing down the overall rate of production of methyl mercury. And again, that's a way that we might be able to lower methyl mercury concentrations and ultimately lower concentrations of methyl mercury in fish. So I mentioned um, before that we, we know now that the algal biofilms within the creek um, are, are a net source of methyl mercury. Um, for us to get a better handle on the magnitude of that impact and its implications for the entire creek, we've been looking at ways to map the creek using some drones to map uh, algal biofilm density along the bed of the creek. Um, and so we've, this is a photograph of one of the drones that we're flying, an instrument package underneath it where it's got uh, real photography, there are GPS units attached to it as well, and then a number of false image uh, hyperspectral um, cameras as well that are, that are attached to it. Uh, and so this shows a, about a 500 meter section of creek uh, that's down near Horizon Center. This is at EFK 6.3 that I pointed out on that first map. Uh, this would be the, just the visual camera that shows you the creek, uh, the flight path of the drone and, the, and the, uh, what you would see for a real photograph. And then this would be the chlorophyll and the next for the chlorophyll in the water and on the water column and on the creek bed uh, so that we can begin to get an assessment of how extensive these algal biofilms are and then be able to take that information and ultimately in, um, include this in numerical models for the creek to get an idea of the magnitude of the impact. Uh, so all of this data is being collected with the an ultimate eye of being ha of having uh, predictive tools, numerical models that we can use uh, to begin to, to not only consolidate and, and codify our understanding, but then that we can use that in some what if scenarios uh, that, that you know you can't afford to do or that might be ill, Ill advised to do uh, for the entire valley. And so uh, for the methylation demethylation uh, kinetics that we've done in the biofilms, we're, we're developing uh, differential equations to describe all of these kinetics. Uh, we talked a little bit about absorption and desorption equilibria uh, and the, the effects of water chemistry on the behavior of these sorbents. Uh, we've got another group that's looking at biokinetic models for mercury uptake by fish and then its elimination by the fish and calibrating those models. Um, uh, measurements of filtration rate by different mollusks and, and ways that that might impact suspended solids in the creek and then the consequent effects it would have on methylation and demethylation behavior, and then developing uh, watershed flow models and, and bringing all of that together in one comprehensive numerical model. So I, I want to circle back at the beginning. I said I'll talk about the creek, um, and, and it might feel, um, particularly because I had to go through this so quickly today. Um, that we're, it seems a bit like a scattershot. We're, we're exploring all these different things, um, but we do have an integrated vision about how all these tie together and that's embedded in that conceptual model that we continue to update. And I also wanna point out that when we talk about the creek, these are five different pictures of useful at Poplar Creek. These are all five very different scenarios and these are all the creek. And, and 
the characteristics and properties of each of these sections and the way the ecosystem is functioning in each place is different. And so we may find a solution that might work up inside of Y12, where it looks a lot like an industrial ditch. But that same approach could easily fail downstream in the forested watershed near the horizon center. So we need a multitude of options uh, that we can deploy at different locations uh, that is much more of a site-specific and targeted approach rather than trying to find a single silver bullet that will answer all the problems that I need. So with that, I'll stop. And again, we're looking for, um, in contrast to the county trying girls who were moving dials just to keep the needle in one place, we're trying to understand the mechanisms behind that. So that if we turn a dial on the control panel, we know that we're gonna get less mercury, less methylmercury, less mercury in the fish, and above all else, no unintended negative consequences for the ecosystem. So thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. Right at the very beginning, you had a slide that showed you dramatically decreased the discharge with no effect on the accumulation or if anything. Is that because the, the methylate, the, the whole reaction was limited by the methylators in, in the process so that you've saturated, even with a small amount of mercury in the discharge, you, you've saturated the uh, reaction? That, that is certainly one of the ideas that we're looking into. Um, but you notice that at that up, same upstream area, the amount of methyl mercury is very low. So we're not, it doesn't appear that we're methylating much of that mercury for reasons we don't quite understand. Um, one thing, I mean, we, we could spend a lot of time looking at any one of those submodules in the conceptual model. Um, the step from inorganic mercury in the water to mercury in fish is long and complex. There's lots of things that happen there. We don't fully understand all of the factors that, that you know, affect the, the net outcome within the fish themselves. Yes, ma'am. So I'll tell you my mercury story. I worked at a major university that had a very old chemistry building and they discovered quite by accident that the drain traps underneath the sinks in the labs were filled with mercury. Yeah. Probably been there for 40 years. Yeah. I had no idea. I guess we can guess how it got there, can't we? Uh, yeah, well, um, broken thermometers, um, lots of ways. Pouring it down the drain. Yeah. The water. Yeah. Um, I, you know, as a child growing up, you know, I have mercury fillings and um, and that was when Dennis still had a spit sink, right? So a lot of that mercury at the dentist went right down the drain. Yeah. So I, I made that. my dimes look very pretty and silver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. My wedding ring turned silver when I was in graduate school. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, Scott, you know, you've done a, you and the group have done an amazing amount of work. And uh, of course, there always comes another question that you probably haven't looked at or may want to look at. Have you looked at the species composition in the biofilm? Uh, because having done work on paraphyton communities myself a little bit, it, it's a, an amalgam of lots of different species and different proportions depending where you are in the stream. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've, we've done, um, in fact, that, that algal biofilm work is a lot of stuff that we initiated. I've, I've been hands-on with. Um, and so we've done a lot of different things with those biofilms. We've looked at their methylation rate in the dark versus the light. If we grow them in the dark versus growing them in the light. And in those cases, we, we do have species identities for the biofilm, for the algae in the biofilm. Uh, there's a lot of genetic data that I just didn't get into. And so we have an idea of what the microbial community looks like, both uh, bacteria, um, um, uh, eukaryotic DNA as well, uh, and also the fungi. Uh, right. And and so we we do have all that. As I said, they they are an ecosystem unto themselves. Um, and and there's there's a lot of fascinating interactions in there. Um, there's a lot of really interesting chemistry in there that affects the amount of methylmercury that gets produced. Um, and and just as an aside, you know, I mentioned one of the rules of thumb for mercury methylation. It's always in an anaerobic environment. Well, here we're getting mercury methylation in an algal biofilm that's producing oxygen, All right? So I've got some data I could show you. I have some extra slides if you're really interested in seeing it, but 
Um, we find really steep gradients in dissolved oxygen concentration that we, we see oxygen right at the surface of the biofilm and you get a, a millimeter or two inside, there's no oxygen there. Um, so there, there is, and as you get just a few millimeters in, uh, we find iron reducing conditions and sulfate reducing conditions. So you go from fully aerobic in the water column to sulfate reducing conditions within a few millimeters. I think that's where that methyl mercury is getting produced. Uh, we've been working, I've been working with a, a guy in the bioscience division, um, and we're, we're trying to find ways to, to get good photomicrographs of what that architecture looks like. Uh, you know, where, where within the biofilm might that be happening? And then um, using some specific gene targets, identify who's doing it. And, and then there, you know, all of that interaction, all that community interaction. That's great. I'm excited about it. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, early on in your talk, you showed a slide showing uh, the levels of mercury in, in your fish, sort of level, and, and the mercury outside is the, what, what maybe maybe the fish died in a certain level. And if you look at the dead ones, they have a lot more. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the, the creek is watched pretty carefully, um, particularly at the boundary between Y-12 and the city. Um, it's related to discharge permits for Y-12, compliance with EPA and state regulations and permits and so forth. So we don't see big fish kills typically. Um, the fish that are monitored here uh, live for a few years. And, and so the, the time course history of the data that I showed there was plenty of time for a new generation of fish to come in, but they're, they're accumulating mercury the same as their parents and grandparents did. Has anybody looked at the effects on the fish? Do they swim backwards or something? <laughs> I don't know. No, no, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I, I cannot speak to the neurological effects on fish of exposure to the mercury or methyl mercury. I heard it was the fish that uh, putting C60 in water caused fish to swim backwards during the yeah. rise the university. It turned out that it was the tetrahydrogeran that they were using to dissolve. Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the things that we've been doing those bucket tests in the worms, uh, we and we had a summer student in um, to help us with some of this work. Um, anecdotally, as my postdoc was moving worms meticulously one by one among buckets, um, there just anecdotally, there appeared to be differences in morphology and coloration. And, um, and so we, we did some targeted experiments to see if mercury exposure was changing that. And one of the ideas we thought were one of the potential implications was, for example, if um, let's say mercury exposure changed the color of the worms, you know, making them more vulnerable to predation. Well, maybe the fish are eating or biasing their prey selection to fish that are high in mercury. And that might be part of the problem. Um, then we didn't really find any great relationship there. Uh, there, were, there were some trends, but nothing particularly eye-popping or, or statistically significant. Um, and the other thing that we have thought about, we, we've not gotten into it, um, but we thought about trying to do some experiments to see if uh, worm behavior was a function of mercury or methyl mercury exposure. So perhaps there, they are less avoidance um, prone, for example. Um, you know, maybe they change their behavior and they come out during the day when they should come out at night and the fish see them. Maybe they don't respond to a shadow that could be a predator overhead the same way a non-mercury exposed one. Um, we, I, I don't have that. I think those are interesting questions to pursue. Um, and, and that might help explain that, you know, the, the aquatics group that Chuck comes out of, um, a lot of people looking at the, the biokinetic models and understanding relationships within trophic webs uh, to understand where, you know, why we're seeing the mercury that we're seeing in the fish. Um, because that the length of that food web is certainly part of the story, uh, but it may not be all of the story. We certainly need to understand that. Scott, we have some, uh, some questions from the, uh, on the chat. Uh, John, John Gunning asks, I had previously heard that Y12 fly ash could have been a significant, a significant contributor to mercury contamination in EPFC. What is the estimate uh, of the percentage of contamination for mercury leakage at Y12 versus fly ash? 
Yeah, great question. So um, I probably misspoke. We do see fly ash in those historical release deposits, but that fly ash does not have any mercury in it. So that's why on that slide, I highlighted those mercury rich particles, which were not the fly ash. Those fly ash spheres don't show any signs of mercury. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's mercury in the fly ash that's leaching out. It's, it's other uh, components of that, of that uh, historical release deposit. What about fly ash from the one seen planet? Well, it would, it would, I, I, I've not analyzed it, I don't know, but um, I, I would suspect that it is similar. Um, the, the fly ash itself has other things in it of concern, selenium, arsenic, that, that might be of concern to aquatic life. Um, but I don't think the fly, and if you notice, uh, it was a number of years ago, that big white stack that Bull Run put up, that was a mercury scrubber. Just, yeah, and that's part of the, um, Compliance with Clean Air Act and, and EPA regulations. John Gunning also asks, asks uh, given the significant amount of mercury accumulated at Y12, could you briefly summarize how slash why mercury was used at Y12? Yeah, mercury was used to separate isotopes of lithium in the uh, race to develop thermonuclear weapons. And it has been called uh, uh, this uh, the second Manhattan Project. It, it was it was considered of vital national importance. Um, presidential authorization to move mercury from storage to Y twelve. There was quite involved. Yeah, yeah, Robert so, Robert Kennedy has his hand up. On the, Robert on the chat. You'll need to be unmuted. Unmute. Uh, two comments. Yeah, it's ironic that. Um, the COLEX uh, that uh, all this trouble was went through to separate isotope, mass separate isotopes of lithium since the Castle Bravo test, 1954, showed that both isotopes of lithium work perfectly well in a thermonuclear reaction. And they knew that since 1954. And the uh, Interesting. Ob observation is that gene for demethylation must be very, very old, like pre-Cambrian. And you could see in the early earth, all the rainfall washing stuff out of fresh crust that life would need to invent, invent a way of getting rid of these inorganic toxins. Okay, so the two questions are. But could you speak up just a bit? They're mowing the grass outside and I'm having a hard time here. Sorry, is this a mic check, mic check? Um, prehistoric sources of um, mercury. Did pre-Columbian peoples use mercury in art? And do we see any uh, possible discharge from there? And for decades, uh, Y12 purchased water from the city of Oak Ridge to put into Poplar Creek to make up water flow in times of low rainfall. And did your historical models take into account those water additions or does it not matter? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, so if I remember correctly, you, there was a question about the use of mercury in art. Um, yes, I, I showed a couple examples. Um, one, one is a, um, a mask uh, dates back about 9,000 years, red coloration that has been traced to painting with uh, cinnabar powder, cinnabar being a mercury sulfide mineral that's bright red color. Um, I, you know, mercury mining, uh, the mines in Almaden in Spain date back hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, the Adricha mine in Slovenia dates back thousands of years. And there are uh, impacts that have been felt downstream of those, not only in the rivers, but in the bays, um, the Adriatic Sea, uh, you know, all of that, you know, coming sourced from those mercury mines upstream. Uh, and there, there's quite a bit of literature out there on research that's been done around that. Um, the, the flow management program that you refer to, um, it, with respect to the water flow model, uh, yes, because we, we will split the record to you know, the period when flow management was on and when flow management was off. Um, and so we, we are accounting for that uh, within the flow model. Um, I have a, a data set that was collected continuously, both before, during, and after, or during the flow management program, 
And then we continued that after they shut that flow management order off in 2014. Um, and, and I wrote a paper last year that's comparing pre and post flow management. There, there were a lot of changes that, that propagated downstream once the flow was turned off. Uh, and I would say not all of them for the good, uh, but we're still, it, it's, uh, these unfortunately are long-term problems with long-term solutions and long-term impacts. And so the, the flow was turned off for a very specific reason and it achieved the goals of the specific reason, but I'm not sure people were thinking about what might happen downstream as a consequence. So we're seeing things that I don't think they're anticipating. An area that hasn't been touched on uh, comes from Chief Nagy. Thank you for, for the great talk. Can you discuss shortly how much the rivers in the area are safe for swimming? On the other side of the ONL, uh, there is Clark Center Park, which is upstream from EFPC. What would that, would that be safe? Yeah, um, to my knowledge, there's no mercury issue in Clark Center Park. Um, it's a different watershed, different valley from East Fork. Um, I, I need to be careful because I'm, I'm not a health expert and I shouldn't be giving health advice. So don't take any of this as health advice. Um, what I can speak to are concentrations and what their levels are with respect to um, regulatory guidelines. Drinking water standard for mercury, total mercury in water is two micrograms per liter, which is well above orders of magnitude above mercury concentrations for many of the creeks around here. So in terms of drinking the water with exposure to mercury, none of the creeks are posted because you can't drink it. It's because of the fish consumption. And that relates back to the whole biomagnification uh, description that we had at the beginning. Um, there, there are a number of um, fish population and fish community sampling um, programs that have been handled through uh, the, the aquatics group at ONL for probably 40 years now, I think. Um, I think that the issue you all wrote was a 30 year anniversary. So it's been 10 years since that was published. Um, so it's probably been a, a 40 year record. And, and those background creeks um, do not show methylmercury concentrations in water or fish comparable to East Fork. That I, I can that, that I can say, but I, I really shouldn't comment on health effects. Scott, we've been going uh, an hour and a half, and I think it's time to shut things down. Oh, sorry. So, no, that, that's fine. It's a, it's a wonderful talk and very good questions. So we want to thank you for uh, spending time with us, and uh, we would like to thank you. Thank you.